What's up guys, it's Dom Matter here, and today we're going to be reacting to Bricky's Total War Warhammer 3 Don't Tread on the Bear video. So, we obviously reacted to a couple of Bricky videos, um, and a lot of them have been Warhammer related, although mostly Warhammer 40k related. And then I had two people recommend uh, in different videos, one on his, I think it was the Warhammer uh, Dark Tide video, one of the two Dark Tide videos I reacted to, somebody said I should check out this one, and another one was on the... Uh, Total War trailer reaction video. Somebody said I should check out this one. So I've had uh, two people tell me I should check out this video, uh, which is from also from Bricky again. We've reacted to some of his stuff before. And uh, yeah, this, this game is definitely seems like it's something right up my alley. I love strategy games. I love real-time strategy games. And I've played Total War Rome before and Total War Rome 2, but I've never played any of the Warhammer games. Uh, never played Total War Warhammer or anything. But this, honestly, it seems like it's going to be one of the ones right up my alley. Probably one of the first... Warhammer games I played. Vermintide's definitely going to be the first one just because I actually already have it. But after that, as I start to delve into more games, I think I'm going to go into the Total War Warhammer series for the uh, the Warhammer Fantasy stuff. So I'm definitely excited to see you know what he has to say about this. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> link to the original video down below, and let's jump into it. My name is Bricky, currently running from corn from paying myself purple. Now, this might come as a surprise, but I like Warhammer. Oh my god! <laughs> I know, I know, shocking, insane, ridiculous, crazy, crazy, one might say. But I can't help it. Something about a galaxy filled with depression and war just makes me so happy and giddy on the inside. However, I don't really know a whole lot about Warhammer Fantasy. My main source of information comes from 40K, and I know fantasy is kind of around, and some things have a little bit of overlap, such as, well, mainly just the demons, but overlap regardless. And for a while... Yeah, so somebody told me I should check out uh, I can't remember the name of the video, but I'd, I'd reacted to it, and they were talking about how Warhammer Fantasy actually really wasn't that popular until the Total War games ca uh, came out, and then it started getting a lot more popular. Um, but apparently, uh, Games Workshop, I think is the name of the company, their most popular one was by, har by far Warhammer 40k, and then they had actually gotten the rights to the Lord of the Rings tabletop, I, I think back when the movies came out in the early 2000s. And that became their second most popular, and then recently they've just been focusing on that instead of actually pumping out Warhammer Fantasy stuff. And apparently you've seen a resurgence of Warhammer Fantasy now that the Total War Warhammer games have come out over the last, like, half decade or however long it's been. Well, it didn't really interest me much. I'm not really a fantasy kind of guy, you know, Skyrim, eh, New Vegas, though, mmm, beautiful. But, you know, the Total War games are pretty- I don't know if I'd consider- New Vegas fantasy. I mean, kinda. It's it's retro futuristic. It's more. I mean, <clears throat> it, I mean, it's it's more sci-fi than it is fantasy, really. Right? Like, yeah. Pretty darn popular, and they've always had a huge following. So I thought, wait, World War Warmer Three is coming out. Perhaps this is the time when I finally delve into fantasy. You would think I would actually be really big in the Total War series because I like my strategy games. I like my RTSs, like my Command and Conquerors. I love my 4X games. Like, well, it's mainly just Endless Space, but I love Endless Space. So this hybrid, this grand strategy game. Oh man, if you like 4X games, you gotta play like. I mean, it's probably the most famous popular of them all but the the civ series is so fucking good C civ is but like a lot of people prefer civ 5 i personally like civ 6 a bit more but you're not going wrong with either one of those and civ 6 actually just had a new dlc game seem really interesting especially in the warhammer universe but i never played a total war game before i just I just never did. But you know, Warhammer, new game, Adeptus Ridiculous kind of popping off. Maybe it's about time I check it out. The question was just, when? You know, I'm faced. I'm cringe. I'm pondered just like singed from Arcane. This game is really stupidly insane. Hello? Uh-huh. Right, right now? Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> this video is sponsored by Total War Warhammer 3. <laughs> Total War Warhammer 3 is- Man, how old is this video? 10 months? Man, that meme's been dead for years, bro. <laughs> I mean, I guess he did say, enjoy, uh, you know, joins the cringe. It's the third installment in the Total War Warhammer franchise, a slew of very popular grand strategy games. The third installment allows you to play as eight separate factions, all with their own stories and their own special campaigns and skirmishes. It has improved co-op features with up to eight players taking synchronous turns and a 
well improved and just really darn good prologue that we'll talk about really soon to really help you get into the total war warhammer series and not only is it available on steam but it's also available on the xbox's pc version of the game pass so yeah i got sponsored they reached out to me let's fucking go dude i'm really excited of course naturally uh my opinions will not change on the game i will give you an honest opinion but I, you know, hey i should also state something very important this is not a full review about maybe 15 minutes in the game i realized i wasn't gonna be able to do a full review there is a lot oh my god i can barely do a review on a singular faction this is much more initial impressions first impressions and hey what's it like playing a total war warhammer game for someone who well you know never did a consistent stream of consciousness freaky consciousness which is uh a violent thing so <laughs> let's begin and we're gonna be talking about this probably quite a lot the prologue uh oh spaghetti -os. so it's a little rare to have a strategy game that has a really solid tutorial normally there's just things you kind of feel your way through with a lot of time and while there are some tutorials that are better than others overall it's a lot of just doing a mission oh, and then a ton of hand holding with it kind of pointing to stuff whenever it was time to use them this is probably the best prologue i played in a strategy game just flat out the best it's a long prologue to begin with it is a multiple hour prologue man i gotta say warcraft 3 probably is the best prologue for any strategy game when you're just playing <coughs> as the orcs and you're like going around trying to find the other orcs it's really good but not only does it really show you how to do all of the various kinds of aspects of Total War, both the overworld kind of 4X style and the actual battles RTS style, but it actually serves as the main catalyst for the entire story of the game. You play as Yuri Barkov of the Kislev army faction thing, which is kind of like a amalgamous group of a bunch of slavic countries all just kind of mashed into one the kids love have a god and it's a bear god named ursan and ursan would always do this big old roar and get rid of the winter and he hasn't done that for quite a while now so people are starving and dying and their god is silent and it's that's not good however the main character yuri has heard from good old ursan and ursan is in trouble and so you need to venture out to go save your bear god and that's the overall prologue your main enemy is the forces <coughs> of chaos all the forces of chaos nurgle zinch corn and slanesh and overall they kind of seem like they make up the major factions of this game chaos is a huge part of the game whether for or against and so setting them up as both the main villain and how they corrupt the younger mortals and stuff is a pretty good start for the prologue and it teaches you all the various gameplay aspects of it i was kind of interested to see that the 4x style of it is it's like each rts is is contained in the separate areas where if i was going to cities and civilization or planets and endless space here we have like fortresses and in those fortresses you can build them out you can give them more upgrades for more income or more growth which allows them to upgrade even more and produce more income or perhaps training areas for higher troops or better troops upgrades etc and these are all contained you also have yeah <clears throat> a lot of the total war games are like this at least the ones i've played and it's hard to describe but it's it's kind of like a mix between like the city aspect of civ 5 i guess or uh you know maybe like a crusader kings how, how the cities work in that uh mixed with like the battling of like a warcraft type game almost because like in some ways you constantly are building like new armies and stuff mixed with like the grand strategy of like a, a civ game it, it, it's 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 definitely unique I've, I've played some of the total war games before and they're all at least the ones i've played are all similar to this i haven't played all the total war games but hero so there's a little bit of like character customization in there as well your hero let's say yuri for example has different gear you can put on him to make him better either in the 4x campaign map or in the actual fighting itself in fact he himself is like kind of like a 
playable piece on a, on a chessboard, except he is attached to a giant army that goes with him, and you kind of move him around as a piece in the overworld. That's how you go attack other armies and attack different settlements, etc. When you actually do a fight, there is an auto-resolve option, but that's generally only saved for when you're going to just absolutely demolish the enemy, and that's the only time I ever really use it. Because when you don't use it, you have a, instead a big old RTS-style actual ground battle, where all the forces you've accumulated, in fact, the forces the enemy has and that's where all the major skill comes from in terms of moving units in certain areas and attacking certain things here and, and activating flanks. abilities when you can that's all the the nitty-gritty ground combat it doesn't require the twitch movement of say starcraft or command conquer where everything is moving really really quick but it's more like an overall macro in my opinion your hero character yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it's, it's a lot more realistic to how they just, like, I, I've never been in a real war, but it's a lot more realistic to how you hear, like, military historians describe, like, real warfare and how, like, a general would, you know, pull out. Like, you know, you have, like, this overview. And, like, if you've ever watched, um, I can't remember the name of the channel, but they do, like, a bunch of, like, old battles from, like, way back in history. Like, a lot of Roman and Greek battles and Persian battles and all that stuff. And they'll they'll show you, like, move around the different units. And, like, these guys came in from the flank and all of this stuff. And they usually have, like, solid bricks to represent, like, the different... Uh, battalions or corps or whatever um it, it's very much like that yuri for example is an absolute monster he destroys everything and he's super tough and tanky and all that kind of stuff because the hero characters kind of have to be if they're wading through the thick of it you know they're, they're very lead from the front and then you have your various levels of troops that you either upgraded or built prior and having the right composition is important because you might have your basic you know sword and shield ground troop and they're pretty good at wading into the thick of it and getting into a big bloody battle, but they might struggle against, you know, cavalry that slams into them. So if you want to deal with the cavalry, you might want to get, say, pikemen, you know, spears and stuff, halberds, things that get it from range and can really stop a cavalry charge in its tracks. But of course, they might not be as good in combat as the sword guys. You have archers who, you know, fire from a distance and they have an ammunition supply, but, you know, you get too close to them and they might get wailed on. There's flying units and ambushing units and sometimes just big artillery units and gigantic freaking monsters that wade in and just destroy everything thing is all the possibilities there combine that with special abilities and like spells from your other hero characters for instance there's like a frost maiden in the kislev faction that sends out ice everywhere there's some there's some really cool depth in there despite the fact that i just you know rambled on a whole lot of stuff about it i haven't even scratched the surface of depth i haven't quite reached that level yet because these are long campaigns and to get those big unit of masses and these giant battles it takes a bit. You really need to get your force up and heavy. Of course, when you win a battle, you can go ahead and replenish your forces or go send it towards the next uh, major settlement and then try to raid said settlement. And when you raid a settlement, what are you going to do with it? You can take it over. You can just ransack it. You can pillage and murder everyone skull, there. Skull, depends skull, on your faction. This is all explained to you in the prologue. You've also got missions you can do that give you rewards. There's your income, and then there's your upkeep of income. Soldiers cost money to train, but they also cost money to, you know, upkeep because they cost food and things of that nature, and you're managing all your different areas. And like I said, this is the surface, and each faction plays massively different depending on which you're rolling with. The prologue actually continues with Yuri slowly and slowly being corrupted by chaos as he makes his way through, utilizing a sword and reading a cursed book, etc., to get their way over to Urson. And when he gets to Urson, well... I renounce you. Oh, shit. Oh, it begins. The man fucking is easily corruptible. Us. I must say, the quality of a lot of these cutscenes is pretty top-notch. The voice acting in this game, almost across the board, especially for some of the Chaos factions, is just incredible. It's really well done, and there's a lot of emphasis and effort put into each of the characters. Let's get down to business to control the world. Yes! Yes! So <laughs> That's from DBZ Abridged, isn't it? It's fucking Piccolo. Once you've played the prologue, which is basically a campaign in its own right and the entire setup for the story of total war warmer 3 
then you can go ahead and jump on one of the eight factions that are available to you. These factions are the Kislev I already mentioned, Shahay, Cathay, Cafe, the, the dragon one, the big dragon, big terracotta warriors and stuff, the, them. There's the ogres, they're big and fat, they eat a lot. You got the Chaos Undivided, and then you got the four Chaos Gods themselves, Nurgle, Korn, Sonesh, and Zeech. And they all play, well, about how'd you expect? I played Kill Final Destroy. Eight so far. I did Kislev, of course, in the prologue. I did Cathay for a bit, Nurgle, Korn, and Slanesh. So I started with Nurgle. That was a mistake. See, each campaign has their own major objectives. And for Chaos, normally the option is just to spread corruption in some way. And for Nurgle, it's, of course, spreading sickness. And they have all their own various ways of playing the game. The main character, it just, I, I love him. I love him so much. This Nurgle guy, he's he just grabs stuff from his stomach and throws them at you. And he's he's got this, like, giant Nurgle, like, mobility scooter looking thing. <laughs> I love it. But, you know, Nurgle as a faction, they play a lot like Nurgle. You know, when you collect any kind of major fortress, it goes through this big cycle of life, death and rebirth instead of a normal buildup. And then you have these insane plagues to spread your sickness around the area. You can create new Bleeding plagues, ears. And mix and match disease and symptoms and how it's spread. And all your army is pretty slow and not super strong, but the tanky is all hell because you're Nurgle. And That's actually cool. It's it kind of like, uh, Man, imagine that would have been such a good concept back in. I guess they really couldn't do it with Warcraft 3 just because the way the, you know, it was co designed with World of Warcraft in order to build into World of Warcraft. But so they had to have a certain story. But just like the concept of like building your own plague, it's like Plague Inc., but also in Total War. And it, I, and I lost my mind. There, it was too much. I had information overload to the max. That the cycle of rebirth with with the different kinds of of structures and and making all the different kinds of of corruptions and plagues, and then the chaos gods themselves with their own afflictions and the way the army construction and it it was a lot. It was a lot, but it was kind of cool because the mobility scooter guy. So I took a break from Nurgle for a bit and I tried out the cafe group. Cafe, cafe, the cafe group. Theirs is interesting. They've got a definitely not Great Wall of China that is being- Definitely not Great Wall of China. Of chaos. Oh crap, I forgot about the whole storyline point. Damn, Damn it. it. All right, side note. What's the story wish The whole point of the story Man. is this old ass- Wish, but I haven't heard fucking where that is like a trip from the past that brought back memories I didn't know I had. Man, Wishbone, that was the fucking dog show, right? Yeah, Canadian television. How did wait, Bricky's Canadian? I didn't even realize this was a Canadian show. Oh, I know, children's. I, I can't fucking read. It's an American, okay, it is an American show. Okay, yeah, it's from Texas. Yeah, I fucking read that wrong and thought it was a Canadian television show. I was like, wait, Bricky's Canadian? I don't even know. But yeah, fuck. But yeah, I, I misread it. Last man, this old ass man got this book and the book is pretty mean to him. And so he's going and trying to get one drop of the bear god's blood to free him from the book. So he's trying to find the most powerful ally to take the god and, you know, do whatever they want with it. So, you know, you go to you go to Kislev and they obviously want, you know, Urson back for obvious reasons. The, you go to Cathay and they, they have their own reasons for knowledge and then Nurgle thinks, oh, I can make a god stew corruption and Slanesh wants the soul and Korn wants the skulls. So you're bartering with each and every one of them. That's why these people are on your side. Okay, out of the way. But Grand Cafe has their giant wall and you need to go ahead and deal with some of your rival factions around it, reinforce said wall, keep chaos off and they have all these different gameplay mechanics to go with them for example their main one is the concept of harmony the yin and the yang and if you're too far building either buildings or research or units that are in the yin side the yang suffers and vice versa so when you're able to keep them perfectly in line and harmony you get massive bonuses so it's like this constant balancing act not only that but you have this awesome compass that lets you get different benefits depending on which way you want to go and at what time and you even have like an oregon trail route that plays a lot like oregon trail you send a caravan to get stuff that's how you get more resources and shit might go wrong there so you know pick your decisions wisely they were also <laughs> a pretty interesting faction i really liked their units instead of kislev that felt kind of like a little more Honestly, the yin yang concept seems really cool um 
I'm, I'm guessing you just probably just switch back and forth every time you choose a tech, though. It, it's, it's a really cool concept, but I, I guess it just kind of stops you from rushing certain technologies. Tech of all trades, everything felt really specialized with Cafe, and being able to have very specific units do very specific things, I felt like my mind was tested a bit more in the RTS style of it, but the overworld part was still... It's a little bit much for Bricky Brain. So I was properly informed by my Twitch chat, maybe you should try corn, Bricky. Corn's pretty simple. I tried corn. Corn's pretty simple. Corn features our main man, Scarbrand, as the main character. And Scarbrand does not fuck about. Scarbrand is a one man army, and he is shockingly good in combat. And just rolling him across the plains is a legitimate strategy. And Corn, <laughs> I mean, what's Corn like to do? You know, Corn likes to kill, likes to murder. Guess what you're doing in Corn? You're doing combat. You're doing almost nothing but combat. You are killing everyone you see. You immediately wage war against every other faction and you just go ham on them. And then, what else does Corn love? Skulls. A skeleton appears. So after you, you know, rampage through a little RTS battle, because corn is not that hard to play because it's just a lot of murder melee units, you then can choose, hey, maybe I'm going to take skulls with a skull throne because there's a lot of enemies here and that's a lot of skulls. And what do you do with skulls? Well, skulls are basically a currency. And the more skulls you get, you can then give said skulls to corn itself because skulls are for the skull throne and doing so gives you a temporary bonus to your army and your faction in general. Cause you know, corn's pretty happy with you. It felt great where my entire purpose was right clicking on things and seeing decisive victory and clicking auto resolve and just watching as Scarbrand rips up everyone. Skulls were being taken, blood was being flown. It was majestic. This actually leads to the battles themselves. A lot of the battles, I'm always very impressed with the volume of things going on. There are so many units in each of these different formations. And then just watching as they move around each individually and the animations they have to, to fight and to get back up and watching Scarbrain just run in there and literally just kick these small mortals beneath him away or watching as a cavalry charge just breaks through a line. It's, it's really interesting to see. There's so much going on at once, but also not. When you scroll back, you can just kind of like observe your forces and watch the health bars dwindle and the leadership bars change and just kind of get a nice overall look at the entire battlefield. But when you scroll in close, you just see chaos and murder and death. And it's it's super well animated. And some of the much larger creatures seem like they are equally well animated. It's something I haven't had the chance to try out too much of yet, but I wanna see the really big, really crazy large characters that you can create. That, that terracotta warrior and Grand Cafe, or perhaps some of those giant ice bears of his oh, life. I haven't got a chance to see much of that yet, but I wanna see, like, seeing them tear through just swaths the armies like Scarbrand does, sounds like it'd be really darn cool. Luckily, and I was kind of surprised by this, I didn't really get any technical hiccups when I was in the RTS stuff. I had a couple bugs here and there and a little bit of frame rate stuff when I was in the overworld, but that's the overworld. I don't really mind that too much because if there's a big frame rate drop and problems like that in the RTS stuff, that's so much more annoying, but I wasn't really seeing it. True, that's it, it's like a big problem when you get into like a lot of end game in a lot of 4X strategy games, just start getting like frame rate issues. Like when you play Civ on like a giant map, a lot of the time you get to like end game and fucking you have cities everywhere. You've got like fucking a hundred cities or whatever. And it's just frame rate issue after frame rate issue after frame rate issue. Especially if you're trying to stream it. Any, despite the volume of people and the fact that I run on a 1080 Ti. Trust me, I would, I would try to get a better card if I could, but you know. So on a 1080 yeah. Ti, seeing all the units go through, I... It was pretty impressive, the processing power to have that many things fighting at once is, is quite something. But having that blend of 
fighting something, perhaps like uh, assaulting any kind of city, and then knowing what to do with said city, and then adjusting technologies, leveling up the skill of your character. It really is this strategy on all these kinds of fronts, the 4X, the RTS, and even the character creation and building. It's a yeah. lot to it. It's a lot. Yeah, it's, it almost seems like a mix between like a strategy game, of, uh, like a RTS strategy, a 4X strategy, and then like a little bit of like RPG aspects. Honestly, this game looks really dope. I, I really want to play this. I'm going to have to go through them because somebody was saying that if you play, if you have all three of them with all the DLCs, you actually get a bonus map on the third one. So I'll just play through them in order, do all the DLC and shit. I won't lie, I have a bit of information overload sometimes with it. There's a lot going on and a lot on the screen, but I feel like every time I jump into the campaign and play a little bit more, a little more of it is starting to make sense. And being able to handle everything at once is always the big detriment. I have that problem when I play a 4X game where I'll forget about something entirely and I forget I need to be working on this. You know, you, you're trying to get all these resources, all this technology, and you always neglect something. Total War and some of the factions there are, are pretty interesting. They seem pretty unique and the voice acting carries it, I think, quite a lot. I'm still rusty. I'm gonna need more time to really kind of get into it. But at the moment, it's a solid game. A lot of the overworld stuff is really good. The design, the visuals, uh, the UI, the red on red, I'm not a big fan of, but overall the characters and the voice acting and even the cutscenes you get before when you pick a campaign faction, there's a lot there. And personally, a strategy game, I think kind of lives and dies by its visuals and voice acting, having you want to make units, not because the unit might be good, but because the unit might be cool. So yeah. Total War, Warhammer 3. I like it. It's a lot. That's so true about strategy games, though, especially um, <clears throat> more fast-paced RTSs. The visuals is a big factor, but so is, like, the, the voice acting is probably the most important thing because, like, the, you're going to hear the voice acting so much over and over again from whenever you click on a unit that if it's not good, it's going to just be ear grating and, like, get you out of the game so quickly. But I'm slowly kind of digesting it more and more, and I'm appreciating it as time goes on. If you're a fan of Warhammer Fantasy, I think it's an automatic buy because it's just there's so much there going for you. If you're a fan of 40k, I'd still recommend it just because you can try out the demons, and that might slowly push you into the other factions and maybe get you more into it. I'm not fully there yet, but playing the demons, I feel like, is a great part for you know stepping your toe into it because. 40k or fantasy you know how nurgle works i think it's pretty solid i think if you like the grand strategy genre it is absolutely worth picking up and like i said before not only is it available on steam it's also available on the xbox pc game pass system as well you can go ahead and check out the instructions on how to get it on screen and i will leave the same instructions in the description as well as a link for you to pick it up for yourself like i said this video was sponsored but my opinions are of my own that being said Pretty good timing for the sponsorship. And with that, thank you for watching this first impressions video. I know it's a little more bare bones, but that, like I said, it would take me tens to hundreds of hours to truly fully delve into this kind of game. And then honestly, I mean, that's what you got Mandalore for. So, you know, go to town. Let me go ahead and answer a couple <laughs> quick questions here. Will you that's funny, because I'm pretty sure that I, I don't know if I've reacted to Mandalore's video on uh, Warhammer uh, Fantasy yet, but I have reacted to a couple of his videos on like the different, uh, Warhammer 40k games and stuff, so it's kind of funny to see him referencing him. Um, but yeah, I mean, that honestly, it, it basically, it looks like a, you know, a lot like Total War Rome 2, but with, like, better graphics. Because what Rome 2 came out, like, how long ago? Uh, 2013, yeah, so Total War Rome 2 is almost a decade old now, because it came out in September 2000, so. And then, uh, Total War Warhammer... Three, I'm assuming came out last year. Yeah, it came out last year. So almost exactly a year ago, just shy of a year. Uh, so yeah, it's basically like a much more polished Rome 2, but with uh, a lot more RPG aspects than I remember Rome 2 having, although it has been years since I played Rome 2. So maybe I, I, I would have been like fucking, I don't know, like 15, 16 years old, something like that. Maybe, oh, I guess it would have been a little bit older than that. I would have been like 17. Um, but yeah it, it honestly seems really good uh i'll have to check it out but anyway let me know what you think like comment subscribe and i'll see you in the next one